and maybe a little omen's going to be sent out here to the commanders of the Confederate Army, probably not appreciated at the time, that Union troops are not going to sh throw down their arms and flee in panic every time they're that the Confederate forces get up in their faces, which seems to have been the case in the first two years of the war. Here in Gettysburg, on Pennsylvania soil, the Army stands and fights. And Confederate soldiers said that after the battle. Union Army fought differently here in Gettysburg. They held their ground. And a fellow by the name of Pickett said that when he was criticized after all of this about the, his defeat. And he said, well, the Union Army may have had a little bit to do with that here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> These monuments that we're driving by are basically along the northern extension of McPherson's Ridge. The hill in front of us is called Oak Hill with a large dominating monument called the Peace Light. We'll talk about that in just a second. And these monuments represent uh, units within Buford's cavalry that were dispersed along this line and extended around to cover the roads that were here so that the Union Army on day one was not surprised by Confederate forces. Now, by late morning or mid-morning, the two sides have fought each other rather nastily. It's been a pretty stiff fight out here, a lot of casualties. But the two sides will basically fall back to a position where the Union Army occupies McPherson's Ridge and the Confederate Army falls back over here to our left on Hare Ridge. And the two sides, even though they're going to be shelling each other and still sending bullets whistling back and forth, the fighting hits a lull and now reinforcements start to arrive on the battlefield. Here, here, this is clear. the Mummersburg Road that we're crossing. It would have been a dirt road, one of the ten roads into Gettysburg, and this is the town of Gettysburg. This ridge line that we're moving down now is the northern extension of Seminary Ridge, often referred to, if you read about the battle, as Oak Ridge, ending in Oak Hill behind us. These monuments represent Union troops that extended the first corps line during the early hours of the battle on July 1st. These are the guys that took on Iverson's Brigade and Rhodes Division as it moved down across these fields. Howard's line runs out across this field. That's a Ford dealership which has been purchased by the park, and that will be removed off the middle of the, of the first day's field. And if I clear these trees a little bit, if you look kind of hard over your left shoulder, that radio antenna is located along the old Harris Road where Early's men marched in from the northeast and flanked Howard's line, uh, ending their stand on day one. If you look at the Ford dealership and then look right above it, you can see a small rise in the ground over there with a tree standing right in the middle of it. That's called Blucher or Blockler's Knoll. There's a farm over there called the Blocker Farm although in German it would probably pronounce Blucher. And it's been renamed Barlow's Knoll for Francis Barlow, one of the divisional commanders under Howard that extended the Union line out to that rise. That's the right end of the Union battle line on day one. That's the line that gets outflanked by Early's men and starts the collapse of the Union forces are here. If you're a fan of the movie Gettysburg, you probably are a fan of Joshua Chamberlain and the story of the 20th Maine. I'll show you where the 20th Maine fought and how they get involved in all this. But on day one, Maine had a regiment out here with the First Corps called the 16th Maine. The 20th Maine, fighting on Little Round Top for an hour and a half, will take 34% losses. And that's nothing to scoff at. It's killed, wounded, or captured back there on that little hill. That regiment, the 16th Maine, will be ordered back up Oak Ridge to fight a delaying action as this line is collapsing. That unit will take 78% losses, one of the top five losses of any unit fighting here at the Battle of Gettysburg. A skeleton was found out here about five or six years ago. Um, found by a park ranger visiting here over the uh, late winter. He happened to be walking down the railroad cut and saw some skeletal remains protruding from the bank, and that took place right over there to the left of the bridge that we just crossed. We're going to retrace our steps here in just a second. So I covered it up. Government actually kept a secret for part of the summer. We knew they would found a skeleton on the first day's field, but they wouldn't tell anybody where it was. They didn't want 40, 50,000 people trekking out here and walking on it to see where they could find it. <laughs> they brought an archaeological team up by late summer, removed those remains, could identify it as a Civil War burial, because they occasionally find remains out here that predate the Civil War. This is a mark marker honoring a position of a main artillery battery here. When the Union Army and Iron Brigade are initially fighting over in the Hearst Woods, and we were just over there, went around that wood lot. That's where General Doubleday's monument is located, and the monument marking General Reynolds' death standing over there. The Union Army will make a stand there. Late on day one, will fall back under Confederate pressure and regroup here in the grounds of the Lutheran Seminary, and then be outflanked by Confederate troops and sent retreating back to the streets of Gettysburg. I have a suspicion you guys have seen this photograph before. It appears on, on Ken Burns' series. You'll see it in a lot of Civil War books. It shows three Confederate soldiers captured here at the Battle of Gettysburg. They're about ready to be marched off to a Union prisoner of war camp. They are disarmed, but they're still showing in that picture that sort of esprit de corps, the fact that we're not defeated even though we were uh, captured and this battle did not go our way. That photograph was taken right over here. 
the camera was about where we're sitting and that lines up somewhere in that general area right there. These are some of the barricades that were thrown up by Union forces in the Lutheran Seminary during day one, it's some of the positions that they fought behind and then later had to give up and fall back on the cemetery hill. So it makes it kind of neat. Yeah. And you know that we know it's that way because if you look at the original photograph that was taken about uh, by one of Matthew Brady's photographers, you can pick out Cemetery Hill and landmarks within the town. It doesn't show up in this postcard, right. but it, it tends to kind of bring it home and make it a little <laughs> bit more fun. Lee is basically here by the afternoon of July 1st. Didn't want this battle the way it unfolded, but he'll take it. He did not plan it. It's more good luck than anything else. He hits the Union forces, which now will become two corps, the 1st and 11th, roughly 20,000 men. Park says about 22,000 men. He's going to attack them ultimately from three different directions by three different Confederate divisions, or actually four different Confederate divisions, and overwhelm them ultimately with about 27,000 men. So he outnumbers the Union troops and he outflanks them. He didn't lay out a map and plan that. It just started to evolve. But Lee is going to take that victory. He's not going to give it back, and he's certainly going to get credit for it. Now he's got a decision to make. By the end of day one, he occupies the town of Gettysburg. He's captured a tremendous number of Confederate troops. He could take the Confederate Army and march it back into Virginia at this point and put this battle of July 1st into the record books as possibly the 23rd largest battle of the American Civil War based on the number of the troops that are on the field. But that's not why he's here. He's here to end the Civil War by capturing or defeating Union forces here on northern soil or gather up and capture Baltimore or Washington or Philadelphia. So he's looking for a bigger goal at this point. He's got the Union Army now concentrating on Cemetery Hill. He knows exactly where they are. So he decides that on day two of this battle, July 2nd, he will now remass his forces and try and dislodge or defeat the Union Army on Cemetery Hill, setting the stage for the second and third day of this battle. If you're the Union Army, you've had a disaster. You've gotten two corps up into Gettysburg looking for the Confederate Army. You've found them. You have fought well for most of the day. And then, largely through the efforts of being outflanked and outnumbered, your troops break and retreat through the streets of Gettysburg. You get manhandled rather badly at that point. And if you're General Meade, you have to concede that you weren't even on the field for the first day's fight. You were still 10 miles to the south in Tawnytown, Maryland. You're trying to figure out where in the heck your army is because you've only been in charge of the Union Army for three days, getting that job on June 28th when Hooker is bounced out of the job by President Lincoln, and you're given the job with orders that you cannot turn the job down. You have to take it. Meade is a no-nonsense commander, an excellent engineer, gets the Union Army moving very quickly towards Gettysburg, and with that movement, causes Lee to start to bring his elements of the Army together. Fence lines would have obviously been here. These are all reconstructions of what would have been here. They probably represent a little bit more than 60% of what should be out here, and Parks has two long-term projects. One is to thin out wooded areas that have become largely overgrown. The other is to reconstruct more fences out here and put the right type of fencing because fence lines influence troop movements. And now Lee is looking at the situation of what to do on July 2nd. He knows the Union Army is right on there on that hill. General Meade, the Union commander, comes up around midnight, takes over command of Union forces in front of us, and now begins to construct a gigantic defensive position that's three and a half miles long from one end to the other. And if you make a fish hook out of your finger like I'm going to do and throw it up here, we're looking at that famous fish hook line that everybody likes to talk about in Gettysburg. It's the shape of the Union battle line on day two and day three. If you visualize or kind of imagine that my fingers are hooked, the barb of the hook will be Culp's Hill, which is about a half a mile beyond those trees. We can't see it from here. The Union line will start there, swing over to Cemetery Hill, literally go right through the grounds of the present day National Cemetery, go right through where the visitor center is located, and now start to run down this ridge in front of us where you can see the monument's called Cemetery Ridge, getting its name from the Evergreen Cemetery. The line will run all the way to the south to a little rocky hill down here called Little Round Top, and that's Little Round Top. It's important because two years before this battle, somebody logged the western face clear of trees, so it's an ideal defensive position. The bigger hill to its right is Big Round Top. That's not important at this point because it's so heavily overgrown with trees and underbrush, and you can't really uh, put any troops up there. So now the defensive position of the Union Army out here is looking like a gigantic fisher. I tell kids sometimes, if you got in a hot air balloon, got up here on the morning of July 2nd, and drifted over the Union lines, and you were up high enough so that you could look down on the position, it would look like a fish hook three and a half miles long. Robert E. Lee is now in the town of Gettysburg. He is bringing up more of his troops, including a guy by the name of James Longstreet, and he's beginning to wrap the Confederate Army around the Union position in a paralleling line that forms a fish hook about five and a half miles long, and the two sides are now going to be separated by all this land out here which now becomes no man's land.